this evening and very excited to talk about what we're talking about. This has been uh, a big, great dream of mine and in my 14 years of priesthood, this is the first time that I've ever done anything like this and that I've taken the time to, I think, in a very true sense to really pray, discern, and put forth through a lot of prayer and study a belief and a statement about why we exist and why we're here and with the hope and the intent that that will keep the fires burning that God has ignited among us. And then we can just all start like tonight with just like a moment of gratitude. I hope that, that you're there with me in that three and a half years ago, where we were at and what was going on and, and what God has done. And I think we just continually just are marveled at what God is doing among us. And I think the question is, how do we continue down that road? And how do we allow God to continue to use us in the tremendous ways that he has? Because it really has been just, it's been, it's been one of the most profound experiences uh, of my priesthood. So, Welcome to the uh, first ever All Saints Parish Leadership, S Leadership Summit. And um, we're going to begin this evening with the All Saints Parish Prayer, which still might be too small for you to read. So I'll pray this prayer, and you're more than welcome to read along if you're able to do so. Most importantly, just pray along with us uh, in your hearts uh, as we offer this prayer to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we the people of All Saints Parish, praise and thank you for calling us to be your people pour down your grace and mercy upon our parish holy spirit send your fire into our hearts and minds help us to obey your will renew us unite us make us one in you lord jesus we offer and consecrate our beloved parish and all that we do to your sacred heart to the immaculate heart of mary our mother almighty and ever-living god we beg forgiveness for our sins, the sins of our country, the sins of our world. We declare you to be our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Free us from the lies and empty promises of the evil one. We offer you our families. We give you all those who are married, strengthen their bond. Bless our children. Let them grow in virtue, knowledge, and love of you. Raise up young men and women who will commit themselves to service as priests and religious. Bring those who do not believe to the waters of baptism and those who fall away from you back to the sacrament confession. Watch over our sick, our elderly, and our lonely, and every soul in need. We thank you and praise you and ask you to hear us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All Saints, St. Saint Martin of Tours, St. Paul the Apostle, St. John the Baptist, St. Joseph, Spouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That is awesome. So, <coughs> we've been praying that prayer, uh, as, you know, we've had prayer cards that are put out, and I know people are praying on their own. Uh, we've developed our purpose planning group, and we pray that prayer at the beginning of all of our meetings. And uh, I was brought up very early in one of our meetings. They're like, this might be the longest prayer ever. Um, <laughs> it's almost as long as one of my Sunday homilies. So, uh, but it really is beautiful. And I just, it encompasses a lot about what's on our hearts as parishioners here at All Saints Parish. So we began this journey of purpose planning at last fall is when it really kind of began. Uh, and we brought it ultimately to kind of to, kind of to crystallization uh, right after the new year. And uh, Christine Eppert, our parish council president, uh, has been kind of the facilitator and the coordinator of the parish planning. So I'm actually gonna hand things over to Christine as she kind of leads us uh, through the first part of this evening's presentation. So um, one of the big things with our parish planning is why now? And um, for us, it's not, hey, the archdiocese or someone's telling us we need to do planning. This is us saying we've come together as one, which, which you know, we've been through a lot in the past three years. 
and we've done a great job of that focus and coming together as one. And now it's like, well, what's next? We got a lot of energy and we got a lot of um, very engaged parishioners. And we find that we're kind of drawing in people as well. And we want to take that momentum and we want to take all of that leadership that we've been getting from Father Meyer and council and others and really accelerate that. And the way to do that and the way to accelerate is to come together around a common purpose. So what we did is we took, um, Father got some inspiration from uh, Rick Warren. This is a, a fairly old book. A lot of people have probably read The Purpose Driven Life. He also has The Purpose Driven Church. And it's got a lot of foundation and fundamental principles in here of if you do something with purpose, if you know and you have in mind what your purpose is, you're all going in the same direction. You get a focus, you build morale. Just like when we started with We Are One coming together with the purpose, it's the same thing. We continue, but the We Are One was kind of like our training wheels. Now we're ready for something a little bit bigger and we wanted to find that, be smart about it, and plan that growth with, um, so the group, we started with, um, we started with that book, and then um, I found this book, which is by a Canadian priest, and he basically took a lot of those principles from Rick Warren's book, and kind of translated them into Catholic speak, and, and talked about his parish in Canada, and how they've really kind of revived and rejuvenated their parish. Because they never really had a purpose that was spelled out, and um, it was very helpful. So we, with our planning group, we came together, and um, we've read this book and the other book. But the one thing that was missing, um, <clears throat> they both were very excellent, and they gave us a lot of ideas. They didn't have a whole lot of structure behind them as far as like a very step-by-step. -step. I come from a corporate background, strategic planning. So we, we've merged in strategic planning with that as well. So we got the best of a Christian perspective, the best of a Catholic perspective. And then we also pulled in like, hey, those corporate people, they do purpose and strategic planning and those kinds of things all the time. Let's kind of meld that together. So this process that we're doing and the exercise that we're doing um, is very unique. It's one of a kind because it's pulling together from different sources. So we're not just following a cookie cutter. We're following what we think is best for All Saints Parish. So um, there's some key benefits here, and these came from Rick Warren. Of <clears throat> He's tried this out. He's, he's built and grown his own church. It's one of the most successful um, Christian churches that just keeps growing and growing. And um, he spells out some of the benefits behind purpose-driven planning and what results you can get. So the first one is builds morale. And he loves to put in the scripture passages, which is great because that's universal where we all um, live in scripture. And it reduces frustration, right? If you know your purpose, everybody knows what the game plan is and um, you don't have to have arguments because you all know the purpose and you all know the foundation. Um, it allows people to concentrate, attracts cooperation and assists evaluation. So really tonight we're talking primarily about purpose, but it's the first step in the journey. And I'll, I'll show you in this next um, slide, this is really a process. So it's not meant to be like, Hey guys, we got a purpose statement. Sweet, we're done, like mic drop, that's it. That's not how it works. Um, the purpose statement drives, and if you notice this picture here, um, let me get the shadows down, um, it's, a, it's a life cycle. It keeps moving, and you keep going through this process. So we're just at the purpose process right now, and we're moving into assessment. So um, the purpose, is your foundation. If you're gonna build a house, you gotta lay your foundation. Your foundation tells you like where you can build. You're not gonna build, start building your walls over on the other side where you didn't build the foundation. Your foundation is 
foundational. That's, that's where you do all the rest of your building. So the purpose statement sets your foundation. The next step is assessment. And for assessment, it's like, well, where are we now? Like, we have a house, we have a parish. Do we have walls? Do we have windows? Do we need a front door? How, how, where are we at right now? We have so many different um, programs and we have great groups and we have festivals. We have a lot of awesome stuff today. And the purpose of this purpose planning is not to get rid of all the awesome stuff. It's to say, how can we build on things that are working well and how can we um, maybe add new things in as well? So assessment is very critical. A lot of times you'll see like surveys, focus groups, financial data. We're pouring over a lot of data, a lot of graphs, and taking a look at assessment. And the hardest part um, is getting your purpose because that's your foundation. Assessment, especially the first time, takes quite a bit of time because you're building it up. Then you move into planning. That's your vision. Where do we want to go? What things, what new programs do we want to implement? What things do we want to enhance or change? And then um, from there, it's the hard work. It's the building. So the planning is your blueprint, but you don't know how to build a blueprint. Let's say um, a, a lot of people skip over assessment. They're like, we got a purpose. Let's start dreaming. And then, and then it's like, well, what if you started someone else started building a house and you took it over. Well, it's already got walls, plumbing, and electric, so you don't need to do that. You don't need to, to do that over. And if you skip over the assessment, you, you skip over being smart about where you put your efforts. So you do the planning, and then, and then it's building. You have action plans and committees if needed, and you make it happen. But the other step that's really critical is manage get the house built, but you can't pay your utility bill, and um, you know you, you don't know a good plumber, those types of things, you gotta, when you set things up, you gotta manage it. Hey, let's start a new committee. Who's gonna run it? I don't know. We'll just pray that somebody comes, which actually could work, but um, <laughs> you wanna make sure that when you set something up, you manage. And then, and then it goes back around. So once we get through the first life cycle, we go back around. We don't have to reinvent the purpose because the purpose is foundational. That stays there. Um, but we do go back um, and we reassess. We, we dream again. We plan. And then we make some adjustments and build. And it just keeps moving forward. So the intent is not only to get a purpose and get this process in place for, for one time around. It's to set up our structure and our um, parish so that we're continually looking to grow and to shift and to change and to manage. And we have the structure and the process there to facilitate those things. So that's that's the process and we're on step one. So what does what does a good purpose statement look like? A lot of times you'll hear mission statement. Some of you might be in the corporate world or be at companies where you have a purpose or a mission. And um, there's really some key things. Like I was mentioning, it's it's like the foundation of your house, so it's foundational. It doesn't change. Once you have your foundation, you can't build your house somewhere else without doing something with your foundation. Your foundation is, is, is foundational. Um, it needs to be original, so we can't just like go to uh, St. Teresa's and say, oh, they got a good purpose, let's just steal theirs. No, this has to be ours. We have to own it. Um, and then parishioner connected, so they need to be able to, every parishioner needs to understand and be able to embrace and live and know what our purpose is. And then it needs to be memorable. And um, Father Meyer's personal favorite is it has to be able to fit on a t-shirt. <laughs> it totally has to be able to fit on a t-shirt. Um, not only for advertising, but also it's talking about the brevity or how long um, the particular purpose statement is. You shouldn't write like a novel. It's not like one piece of, hey, what's our purpose statement? Uh, I need a theology degree to read this. That's not the intent. It, it needs to be brief, and then it needs to provide focus so that when we read the purpose statement, we know our purpose and we're focused and we're all moving in the same direction versus I, I kind of don't know what that means, and then I float off in different directions. So 
the intent is that it provide focus. And so kind of on the other side where the big X is, the don'ts of a purpose statement, like I mentioned, it's foundational. So you don't want to change it frequently. Um, you don't want to copy it from another group. You don't want it to be ambiguous or unclear. Again, you want people to be able to understand it. And again, you don't want it war and peace. You don't want to be overly wordy. And let's see, it, your purpose doesn't give your vision. Your purpose is foundational. It doesn't say like, hey, we're going to be the best parish ever. Some purpose statements might say that, but um, it really isn't vision. It's foundational of what we're going to do, what we're focused on, why do we exist. And then um, you don't want it to distract. So there's three key components of a good purpose statement. One is it tells you what we do. The second one is who do we do it for? And the third is um, what benefit does that provide? What's, what's in it for the group, for the who of what it provides? And I'll just give you like an example. We went over a lot of different examples in our planning group. Um, we did all corporate examples because I didn't want anybody's mind to be skewed of like another parish type of example. So um, how many people, we're going we're gonna to do Google. So how many people um, have used Google in the past day? Totally. What about Gmail? Anybody have Gmail? What about uh, Google Chrome? You like Chrome or you like Internet Explorer? Or Firefox, I think there's like another one. Um, what about Google Chromebook? Anybody have one of those? Got a couple, got a couple. So what the heck do you think their purpose statement is? They got a search engine, they got email, they got Chrome, they got Chromebook. Like what the, how? They gotta have like a pretty big purpose statement, right? Like they do a lot of pretty huge stuff. Actually, I picked Google because they have like the simplest, craziest, but very focused purpose statement. So here's Google's purpose statement. Our mission is to organize the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. That's it. One sentence, no big words. So what, what is it that Google does? Their what? I'm going to read the statement again and then I'll tell you the what. Our mission is to organize the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. Their what of what they do is they organize information. Simple. Does search engine organize information? Most definitely. Um, Gmail, ask Hillary Clinton, she'll tell you they organize information. <laughs> um, Chrome. Definitely, that's a web browser, that's how you get it. In a Chromebook, it's a laptop, it's organizing information. So their whole what is organizing information. Who do they do it for? The world. Can Google claim that they do that for the world? Actually, yeah, they can. Because they do do it for the world. And then their benefit is to make, it, to make information universally accessible and useful. Simple. It's, uh, it's really like an amazing, amazing purpose statement. Almost as cool as ours, but um, it gives you an example of you don't have to write a novel. It can be very short and sweet and focused. And when the executives at Google are meeting, I'm sure, I've never been there, but I'm sure that they're like, hey, does this help us organize information? And if yes, let's go for it. If not, they probably take it off the table because there's probably a lot of things and a lot of opportunities that Google can do. So with that being said, I think I'm going to hand it back over to Father Meyer to take you through the magic of purpose statement. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Christine. And for those of us for the past uh, few months that have been on this uh, planning committee, actually, those, for those of you who have been on the purpose planning committee, stand up real quick. Ray Johnson and Cindy Bagley and Joan Brewer and uh, David Annie Olker and Christine Epper and not with us this evening is Patsy Ullman and Lisa Crail and Mark Schmidl and that's everybody. We've had, I kid you not, we, we, we meet for three hours at a time. It is very intense. You just saw Christine, like I'm just telling you, it is, it's fantastic. It's been an amazing process and she's been an amazing guide. So this is what's this is what's key, and I, I challenge you: go home tonight, get on the internet, and just type in 
parish mission statement and read a whole bunch of type in archdiocese Archdi archdiocese minneapolis mission statement i'm just going to tell you you are going to see this it's amazing what people's mission statements are sometimes they're an entire page and you're going to be confused on who is this really being applied to who are we marketing to what is this really all about purpose 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 is huge so um Oh, this is really this is really your your slide. But I'll go. Do you want me to cover it for you? You want to do the cute thing at the end? Either way, I'm fine either way. Okay, so for the for the sake of one last transition, so uh, this is uh, Christine's little coming up. This is uh, how to make a uh, how we made our mission statement. Uh, she says it's a lot like baking a cake. It's mixing ingredients together, the brainstorming, baking is the thinking. Uh, applying the icing is the review, and here's the detailed recipe, the purpose statement recipe. The ingredients, one to two hours of brainstorming, three pages of lists, and I actually put the lists up on the walls. This is just one meeting, just so you know. This is like, it's been, like we have pages all over the place. I just brought those up because they, 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 they fall directly into what we're doing today. Prayer, no, quali no, no quantity is too large of this ingredient. Then it says this, Combine all the ingredients together into a batter, lists. Place the batter into a pan for organization, what, who, and benefit. Uh, benefits a statement. And you are now ready to bake. Put in the oven, thinking, at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, no preheating required, but additional prayers encouraged. In the baking process, uh, additional prayer, spiritual inspiration, church teaching, the love of Jesus Christ, and creativity were applied to make the cake rise and bake until golden brown. Take the cake out of the oven and let it cool. Once cooled, apply the icing. By performing a review statement with, with, with the strategic planning team, parish council, a priest friend in New York, Father Brian Stitt, and, a course, and of course a high school English teacher who um, made a few little uh, grammatical corrections to, <laughs> as you know, my problems that I have. Uh, and now you are ready to serve. So that's kind of how we ultimately formed uh, what you see on the wall. So through all this planning and processing, and you, we, we, we came up again and again, what do we do, for who, and the benefit provided? So. In, in, in the basic understanding of what it is to be Catholic, what it is to be Christian, those of you who knew the Baltimore Catechism, why did God create you? To know him, to love him, and to serve him. If we look at that know, love, and serve, we're going to find what, what, what the church refers to often as the, the three munera, I'm using like unrelatable words, the three munera, the three offices of Christ, so Christ is priest, prophet, and king. So priest meaning worship, prophet normally referring to teaching, and king, Jesus being king doesn't mean I, I'm going to govern and lord over you, but then I'm ultimately going to serve you. So priest, prophet, and king can be ultimately redu re reduced down to worship, teaching, and service, which if you then translate those down to the Baltimore Catechism, love is worship, knowledge is teaching, and service. So know, love, and serve, priest, prophet, and king, worship, teach, and serve, again and again throughout our, our Catholic tradition, those three things are what we do. That's why we exist. It's our purpose. Even if you look at the United Catholic Appeal, which we all love and support <laughs> very well here at All Saints Parish, 200% of our goal. The United Catholic Appeal a few years ago, it rebranded itself, and it now markets itself under the three munera, the three offices of Christ, priest, prophet, and king. You can actually donate to one of those offices, those three, those three ways. You can donate to worship, by, which, which goes to either seminary formation or clergy retirement or sister retirement. You can donate to the Office of Catholic Education, Faith Formation, Schools, Evangelization, or you can offer, you, you, you can make, make donations to Catholic Charities, which is Compassionate Service and Love of Neighbor. So as we, as a group, kept like going over all of this, we kept looking at like, what do we do? 
Know, teach, engage, worship, sacraments, prayer, devotion, save, serve, grow. All of this kept coming back to, to, to the three the three teachings or the, the three ways that, that Christ puts himself forth. For who? Who do we serve? We, we serve ultimately three groups. And this is, this is very key for us at All Saints Parish. And I think it's become, it's, it's one of the reasons why I think that we're seeing the growth that we're seeing is that although we haven't put it down into a purpose statement yet, we've become very intentional that we don't exist for ourselves. It was the critique of connected in the spirit. Prior to connecting the Spirit, we were perceived as four parishes that exist to maintain themselves. Why did we have what we had? Well, to pay the bills for our buildings and to take care of ourselves and to make sure that we exist the next year. We, just by, by nature of existence, we turned in a bit on ourselves. I think what, what, what we've seen in the past three years is the fact of, wow, well, because of the flourishing, there's been less of a concern about are we going to be open next year? Because of where we're at with stewardship, there's less of a concern of like, we need to count every single nickel and every single dime, and we need to be concerned about those light bills and those electrical bills, and what about the roof, and we need to plan. There, there's like, God's going to provide. And then we, we begin to realize there's a lot of people out there that, that God is calling to holiness and to relationship and to community and what are we doing about them? Connecting the Spirit made a lot of people fall away from the church. So a huge emphasis of ours is like, we have to go out and get people and bring them into our family. So connecting the Spirit forced us out of ourselves. We, couldn't, we could no longer be self-enclosed. We had to go out of ourselves because we had to bring people back. But then it was like, well, why just try to bring back the people that like, used to be here? Let's go out and get people who were never here. Let's go out and get people who like don't know Jesus at all. So we found ourselves talking about three categories. What we refer to as engaged Catholics. So people who yeah, like, stuck it through connecting the spirit. They're like, I don't care, like I'm still here, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I believe. Okay? People who who struggle, and we all struggle in our own ways. This isn't this isn't at all speaking down on people. People have legitimate reasons of why they get hurt by the church legitimate reasons. And so we said, we, our heart has to be with them. But then our heart, our, our, our heart also has to be with people who, who aren't Catholic or aren't fallen away Catholics. Our heart has to be concerned about people who, and there's, a, there's kind of a lot in this category, the unbaptized, but also people who are Christian that love the Lord and serve the Lord in tremendous ways, but we need to be blatantly honest, we would love them to be a part of us. So the what is key, I mean, sorry, the who for us as a, as, as a parish has been very, very guided by the Holy Spirit. And I think it's good for us to, to name that, and I think that's what this purpose planning has very clearly laid out, that there are three kind of groups of people, and people kind of are all over that, but three very clear things. And then what benefits do we provide? Why join All Saints Parish? Why come to Mass on Sunday? If you're, uh, which you are tonight, you're, you're here tonight because you're engaged somehow, like, what benefit do you have of being a part of our parish? Why, why not go to St. Teresa? Why not go to St. Nicholas? Why not go to St. Louis? Why not go to, why not go to Church on Fire? Why not go to the Presbyterian Church? What do we provide? And this, of course, in a very, I mean, in a basic sense, we're like, well, we provide salvation, we provide the saints, we provide uh, heaven, access to heaven, access to the sacraments. Um, very kind of directed in where we've shifted with a lot of work with dynamic Catholic. You know, I think there's a, there's a, a great desire for seeking holiness and becoming the best version of ourselves, of seeking to be uh, the dream that God has for us. Uh, the benefit that we provide for people is hope, compassion. The benefit we, the, 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 we try to offer is to be a refuge and a solace uh, and to journey with people on the way. Uh, so those are just, that, those were 
other pieces of paper that that really kind of drove us to say, this is what we do, this is who we are, and this is who, this is why we do it. This is the benefit that, that it brings forth. So this is the All Saints uh, purpose statement. Right there. So. Our purpose at All Saints Parish is this. Forming the saints that God is calling us to be by providing faithful teaching, authentic worship, and compassion and service. Our faith and actions nourish engaged Catholics, inspire unengaged Catholics, and invite all to Christ's church. This is why we exist. This is why All Saints Parish is in Northern Dearborn County. This is why we do everything we do. And if not, then there's a great question, then why, why should we keep doing it? Why are we doing it? So we're gonna, and, and hopefully you see in this, the what we do, we teach, we worship, we serve. You see in this the for who, engaged, unengaged, and all, and you see the benefit provided. So I want to just kind of briefly go through um, what I'm finding the more and more that I kind of just work with this. The, the descriptor words beforehand, I, I believe are very, uh, they're powerful words. And I think they describe very much so who we are as a parish. So when it comes to, 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 to faithful teaching, when it comes to us, how we know the Lord, how we pass on the teachings of the faith, one thing that came very clear to us is that we really are a very faithful parish. When it comes to our catechetical instruction, when it comes to our teaching methods and models. I'm looking at Bruce Weaver right here who, who runs our adult faith formation programs all throughout the year. We run top of the line faith formation programs for our, for our adults. If you are hungry to know the Lord in a new way, you can do that. And there, without any thought that what might be presented will actually not be authentically Catholic or won't be a faithful teaching of the church. Our Catechesis of the Good Shepherd program, as, which has become our parish in a very true sense when it comes to catechesis, has only three textbooks. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Bible, and the Roman Missal. That is how they teach. That is how they lead children in prayer. That is, that is their catechetical formation. Um, when we look at the desire and the hunger that we have in our parish, it's for good, faithful teaching. Uh, and it's also something that we wanted to make very clear that that's also where we want to we have that as a, a statement of where we're going in the future. When we look at our Catholic school, Every parent that sends a child to our school, the first reason that they tell you why they go to our school is because of the faith components that are in our school. Because our school is a faithful school. Try to find another school in the Archdiocese where the kids go to Mass two times a week, they pray the, the Rosary a week, and the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and they pray the Angelus, and they, like, it's faithful. We have teachers who, who literally embrace the faith in a beautiful way, and that's what they want. Um, this is no Leah Schmidl here not to defend himself, but like Leah Schmidl is like amazing. <laughs> People want their child to be taught by Leah Schmidl because they're like she she she's faithfully living the faith. Like that's who you want with your children. That's what we do. Authentic worship. So this word here uh, was kind of one that we kind of went over a little bit, but we. <laughs> 90% of, of, of people who, who are engaged in All Saints in, in any type of way, this is, their, their, this, is the, this is how they know All Saints Parish. The 80-20 rule exists, we know that. The majority of people who somehow are, have contact with All Saints Parish, it's through our worship. And when you look at worship at All Saints Parish, we can use a whole bunch of descriptors. And we have over here, not descriptors, that was on another sheet, but this is just kind of like the list of things that, that are part of 
our authentic worship. Because it, it is Mass, but it's also everything else that happens at our parish that makes us a very authentic Catholic experience. It's the processions, the devotions, the novenas, uh, the environment, the music, the servers. It's, it's the whole authentic Catholic experience of what worship is and can be in the church. My, and we all know this, but like my policy and my, my vision is that we should have every single experience that one can have at our parish. If the Catholic Church has processions, we should have them. If the Catholic Church has novenas, we should have them. Because we're Catholic. And all of these things are very powerful and they're sensual. They're, they're, they're who we are. And as we all know, particularly with where we're at right now with celebrating Mass in both form, forms with, uh, with the Novus Ordo of celebrating Mass, facing the Lord, facing the people, ad orientum versus Pope, versus Pope alone, that like there is, we, we're, we're, we're a parish that, to be honest with you, is going through a liturgical experiment at the time, but like if we look at the response of it, it's been very, very positive. People have a longing. The, the, the comment that I get from, 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 from visitors most when they come to our church and I recognize them as they're walking out of Mass and I shake their hands and I'm like, oh, you're a visitor this week, which is, by the way, we should all be doing that because it really is amazing. The, the joy that that brings to someone's heart when they realize that someone actually welcomes them. But anyways, so I do it all the time because I know all of the people that come to Mass every weekend. There's only a thousand. And I, I, I recognize, and I'll, I'll walk up and, and like literally tears in people's eyes. Father, that was the most beautiful Mass I've ever seen. Father, I haven't seen a Mass that reverent before. Like, and then when you talk to people, like literally sit down and talk to them, they'll, they'll tell you. They're like, the experience of reverence and the experience of other. And when we, as a, as a planning group, and I mean this, this is an affirmation, I'm like, once again, I'm sitting in front of all of you who do all these things, but like Cheryl and Chad and Cindy and who else do we have here? Bruce, Greg, like our music ministry for four masses every single weekend that is put on by the heart of a parish. I mean, like, we have genuinely powerful masses and not just masses. We had a recovery addiction prayer service last Wednesday night that blew Protestants away. They were so moved by what we offered. Like we're opening up a shrine to Our Lady of Fatima this week. I mean, like it's the authentic nature of our worship is 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 key to who we are, and for us to name that, and for us as a parish to say this is what we do to offer back to God what he's given to us. That our worship is, is God oriented. that our worship is focused on, on, on the Lord and on us receiving and us creating a Catholic culture. Um, when it comes to compassionate service, uh, so when we look at the three priest, prophet, and king, when we look at no love and serve, at the heart of what we're supposed to be doing is we're supposed to be going back out then in the community. So once again, if we look at connecting the spirit, as I've explained to our, our purpose planning group, one of the reasons why, why when I first came that I started the gobble wobble was because I knew the critique of the archdiocese. And I was like, okay, uh, on my tick list is the first thing to do is to like figure out some ways that we can start doing events that have nothing to do with us that uh, help the poor. And I will never forget after the first gobble wobble um, Bayard and Paulette just finished the walk. And I'm, uh, sorry. They walked up to me and they said, Thank you for putting on the first All Saints event. And at that point, we had really just kind of been maintaining like previous things. You know, we, we, could, we could put festivals on that we put on. We'd, but this was like the first new initiative, like the first big, we had combined parish council, and, but this was, it's kind of it. And I was just like, wow. 
you know, now it makes, uh, what, what was our revenues last year? Twenty-five, a $25,000 grant uh, uh, fundraiser. It has nothing to do with us. We actually lose money on the deal, and we're happy about it. We're like, let's make some more copies of paper. Like, we're going to give $25,000 to the poor. You know, when you think about our Christmas giving, when you think about what we do for the Pregnancy Care Center with that spiritual adoption program, when you think about, like, the ways that we've come out of ourselves and have become truly a name in the community of, 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 of compassion. And it's not, it's also us serving one another. We, like, it, it has to be. I mean, look at our Lady Sodality. I mean, we're preparing this weekend for Mother's Day, you know, and we'll have that special collection. I mean, like, I'm getting, like, the way, that, the way that those who mourn in our parish are comforted, I, 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 don't, I don't know what else to say, except, like, you aren't going to find it. The letters, for those of you who have had a, a, a loved one die, the letters and the cards and the meals and the assurances uh, are, are, I just, just yesterday, I was, saw someone carrying around a prayer blanket. And I was just like, I, mean, just, it was, it was, it was kind of, I don't even know, who, it was one of you? I don't know, it was just <laughs> yesterday. But someone had a prayer blanket. What? Judy Leonard. Yeah, that's what it was, it's 7.30 Mass. And I said, who are you taking that prayer shawl to? And she said uh, that prayer blanket tube, and it was someone not in our parish. It was someone, uh, I'm pretty sure. brother-in-law. There you go. And I was just like, that is awesome. Like, that is awesome. When you think about what we provide, even just, I, I love Our Lady Sodality. I really, like, I really do. Like, you think about Mary's Way, and I know that, like, probably almost every woman here has gone to Mary's Way, and if you haven't, you should. But, like, what that provides to women, this past Mary's Way, like, I don't know a woman in that gym that wasn't crying. That, but like how many non-Catholics were there that we were providing a service to that didn't cost them a dime and was really us just saying, we want to love you and you need to know that God loves you. I mean, it really is just a... Uh, so compassionate service can never end. It needs to keep growing. It's... it's it's gonna, it, like all of these do, but like... So this is... That's what we, we do in a very true sense. Um, and I, th I think we do it like in, in, yeah, we need to keep evaluating and assessing, like this is who we are. Faithful teaching, authentic worship, and compassion service. So then the question comes to the who, and this is where, so it is, if you get on the internet, this is where many of the church mission statements kind of crumble down of who they are actually serving, which I think is really gonna be key for us in being an intentional parish and a purpose-driven parish is that we know who our, who our people are. So th the first is, is, is nourishing engaged Catholics. That is our, our goal. And, and if you go back up to the, the top three, we have to be doing those three well for us to be nourishing engaged Catholics. We have to be providing faithful teaching, we have to provide authentic worship, and we also need to be providing compassionate service in-house but also, we need to, the way that you nourish actually Catholics is you get to come out of themselves because then they actually experience the joy of the Lord, right? Like that's how you nourish a Catholic is, is, is when they say, oh my gosh, I'm called to serve people. And when I serve people, I realize that I'm fully alive. And until I was really, full, really serving people, I wasn't actually really nourished by the Lord in the first place. So we see that this comes in a very true sense, uh, our mission uh, in a very real way. Inspiring and get unengaged Catholics. So, once again, we'll, we've become very intentional about this. And the three above are, are, are our main ways that we do this. But when we think about our Homeward Bound ministry, which has been in existence prior to me being here, uh, that was founded by Father Scott Nobby, we think about what we do at Christmas um, with the gifts that we present. We think about the evangelization tables we've been trying to put up at all of our events. We think about the way that we have become intentional at our festivals, about having catechetical opportunities and museums and ways to inspire people and to intrigue their imagination. I think this is a huge part of what we do at worship at our parishes as well, like our funerals and our weddings are 
huge for people coming back to the church. They're huge. And how people are treated and how we inspire them to, be to believe that there's something besides just what they believe about the church. It's tremendously important. And then inviting all to Christ Church. This, once again, everything always needs to constantly be worked on, but, but how are we intentionally going outside of even just our family and our friends who are maybe Catholic and either practicing or not practicing, and really be bold. It is not part of Catholic culture to invite people to the church. It's not. We are very uncomfortable with this, but I would like to say, we're getting a lot better. Every single year, our RCA numbers are growing. Every single year, there seems to be more and more opportunities that we're presenting ourselves out in the public sector to say, hey, you're all welcome here. Hey, we want you to be a part of what's going on. Hey, what we have to offer is something that we really, 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 really value. So I want you to just take a moment to just think of the different ministries that you either are an executive team for or lead. And, and put them up on the purpose table. Do you see how your engagement and your involvement is part of the purpose and the mission of our parish? If you're not shaking your head, then we probably need to kill your ministry today. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I, I want this to be really encouraging and this is something that the, the purpose planning group, we, we didn't want anyone to like come and be like, oh my gosh, like we need to change it. No, no, this is not, this is not us saying you need to change everything. This is us actually, it, it should be very affirming, but it should also be like, how could we adjust? Or what are some ways that we could do something different or tweak something? Solely from my, I, I, I'm going to use this just as one example, but the festival, exa the, the festival evan evangelization that we're doing with uh, the very non-threatening displays. So I tell you, like that, a very simple <coughs> tweak that turns our festivals into something much more. You know, you get chicken beer, and now you get Jesus. And now that Jesus wasn't there before, he always was. But it adds a very non-threatening way for us to put our purpose all the more forth. Let's be honest, our festivals exist for a very, very, very important reason. They exist for relationships, to be bonded and grown. And they, and they exist to raise some stinking money so we can authentically teach, I mean, so that we can faithfully teach and authentically worship, and we can do compassion service. I mean, they, they have a great purpose. Getting rid of them would be, would be a loss. Um, so, leadership actions. Um, leadership people. So, I do, I want you to personally meditate, ponder, discuss, um, and live the parish purpose uh, as a leadership witness. We want to guide and direct all decisions and actions of your committee, the work that you do in the parish, to the parish purpose. How does this teach worship or provide service? Are we reaching engaged Catholics, unengaged Catholics, or all with our committees or our commission's actions? What can we adjust that will move us closer to our purpose? And the purpose, like, I love the word adjust. There was a priest in my seminary. He said never, ever, ever use the word change. The word change scares people and threatens people. If you actually go back and read every single uh, article and letter that I wrote during uh, the forming of our parish, I never once used the word change. I use the word adjust. It's a much calmer word. <laughs> what adjustments do we need to make to have our purpose all the more clear in who we are and what we do? Um, and is there anything that we shouldn't be doing, that we should stop doing, because it takes away from our purpose? Uh, there is no committee or task too small for the purpose. Uh, I just clean the floors in the church. Great. 
because the floor is beautiful for our authentic worship on Sunday and honors God in what we do with our purpose. Uh, St. Therese, the little flower, we have two statues of her, one at St. Paul's and one at the St. Joseph campus. Miss no single opportunity for making some small sacrifice, here by a, by a smiling look, there by a kind word, always doing the smallest thing and doing it all for love. We are one in Christ's church through our purpose. Um, we're going to start putting forth some tools to kind of help bring this about. Uh, letterhead and things of these sorts where the purpose statement can be very clearly seen. We'd like that purpose statement just at least to be included in or after the prayer. Because the more that our parish and my book, uh, the more that my parish, the, the more that we, that our parish embraces the purpose and the mission, the more that, that we will flourish. It, it, it's, it's completely true. Um, my prayer is that it becomes a common language between the committees and the committee leadership. I have a bulletin article coming out this weekend on the weekend of the 28th. Uh, my homily that weekend is, can, that, that weekend particularly is going to kind of be like the big All Saints Parish purpose weekend. The new parish t-shirt this year will have the purpose statement on it. Um, so uh, we're going to move in that direction. Uh, so affirm what we're going to do, activate, and adjust. Um, and she has, Christine wrote this beautifully down here. Um, so I, I love this quilting one. So we have a quilting group. Invite non-Catholics to participate and share the joy of Catholic fellowship and service. How simple is that? Often our thought is just like, well, I just uh, who who in, who in the parish directory could I have come to the quilting session at St. John's? Well, in fact, invite your neighbor who's not Catholic. He said, hey, just join us for conversations. Totally non-threatening. If you can sew a stitch, we'll take you. <laughs> but that longing should be in our heart for unengaged or for all to be a part of who we are and what we are um, and how we make things happen uh, in a very purposeful way. So uh, homilies, ask for the mother comes, the bulletin. I'm actually going to go through the six <coughs> words, authentic, faithful, and compassion, and then uh, inspire it. Uh, invite. invite and nourish. Uh, I'm going to do actually a six <coughs> a six-week series on those words, which I think are very powerful words, and mm, I love them. Um, so we'll go through that. I'm going to actually put the purpose statement back up here so we got it there. Um, we do have... Uh, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me take questions that anybody has or comments. I guess... Yeah, let's start with that. Just questions, comments on... Yes? I don't know if this was on purpose or, or what, but you described no love, sir, faithful, authentic, compassionate. And I'm kind of a broken record, anybody that's been in any of our faith formation classes. That's discipleship. Discipleship of Christ is what's up. Thank you. Because, okay, so let's ask a question. What is the goal of, what is the goal of a parish? What, the purpose of a parish is to ultimately form disciples of Jesus Christ. So yeah, we, we should be a disciple-making factory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could put the PowerPoint actually on our website. You we can totally do that. We have technology. <laughs> Other questions or comments about? We'll also take critique. We're like we 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 do not believe that we're infallible. I will tell you that it's been a lot to get here. Like 
Good powerful though. Like very rewarding. So anyway, I guess we this I'm hoping that's the case, but like is there a sense that like this does seem to be a snapshot picture of who we are, where God has been working in a very real way, in a very tangible way, and God dwelling where we're going to keep following faithfully? Okay. And I'm not, I, I didn't say that just because I wanted you all, like, but genuinely, like, that's our, we've been wanting, and, and it's been really great, like, this group, and just, like, the dynamics of it are very, 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 very interesting. You know, we have people that were born in our parish. We have people that literally have just joined. Uh, Lisa Crail is one of the newest members of our parish, and she has, like, dove head on in uh, into our parish. Um, but they I mean, they haven't even been here a little less, I mean, less than a year. Um, the Olkers are a newer family, but not new, new. Um, so just, uh, it's a great mix. Uh, we have people that are engaged in all types of ministries and uh, all types of histories, and it's been uh, been a blessing. And this is just the beginning. So just to like, <laughs> Steen keeps driving the ship. <laughs> like, okay. I told my son, I was like, I got to give, I got to give Father Meyer homework. One of the things that one of the things that we're doing in the assessment phase, I had to take a month of my life and break it into half hour segments and literally plot what I did for an entire month. And I did this. And then it all got coded into <laughs> into whether I was teaching, whether I was praying, whether I was celebrating the sacraments, whether I was catechizing, whether I was in the office, whether I was visiting the sick, visiting the homebound, blessing homes, uh, cross country and track. Um, and, it, and so very interesting, but, but, but it, 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 it's one of the questions for assessment is your priest doing what he should be doing or is he doing things he shouldn't be doing? Is are certain things being overemphasized or de-emphasized and how do we adjust that as a parish if we want to say that this is our purpose? This is our purpose. Is everything in line with it? And if it's not, then how do we, how do we adjust that? What grade did you get? <laughs> there is no grade. <laughs> uh, I think the recommendation is to sleep more, um, but I don't know. That's a good idea. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, so with Right now, we're saying reflect, pray. Begin kind of just to do some assessment, kind of maybe yourself. The, our purpose plan commission will actually eventually roll out assessments and assessment tools. So that will all, but like right now, it's just really, here is our purpose statement. Let's just kind of like wrap our heads around this and then we'll move forward with assessment, then we'll move forward with planning, and then we'll, yeah. Is that? So we're just asking you right now to just be excited that we have a purpose. Um, yeah. That was an awesome question to come from the leader of our Kingsmen, a group of guys that are very concerned about getting things done because we're good men. We put on men's conferences like that. Just awesome. Um, anything else? I say this all the time. I will continue to say it, but I am thrilled. Uh, honored and humbled to be your pastor, and uh, yeah, let's uh, continue to respond to God's grace uh, in what he is doing uh, among us. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for forming All Saints Parish. We thank you for the tremendous ways that you have given us individually an invitation 
to know you, to love you, and to serve you. We pray tonight that the purpose of our parish may truly sink into our hearts. We may rejoice in the faithful teaching that we have received. We will continue to bring forth faithful teaching. We will have grateful hearts for the authentic worship and the way that we encounter you, the way that we receive you. And that you'll give us the courage to invite people to be a part of the worship that we offer to you. And we ask tonight also your blessing upon the many, many ways that we compassionately serve one another, our brothers and sisters in Christ, but also those on the fringes, those on the outskirts, those who need your love most dearly. We thank you for our parish, and we ask that all the more with this intentionality and with this desire to have a clear purpose, a clear vision, a clear hope, that you may allow us to flourish all the more and to truly be the hearts and the hands and the feet of you, our Lord, here in Northern Dearborn County. We ask this the intercession of our Queen and our Mother, that she may as well continue to allow that fire to burn in our hearts as we ask her intercession by praying, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming, everybody.